October the 6th, 1973. Hundreds of Egyptian tanks surge across the Suez Canal in a bold and shocking surprise attack on Israeli forces. The desert is moving like earthquake. Determined to avenge their humiliating defeat in the Six-Day War of 1967, Egypt strikes deep into the Sinai Desert. What has been taken by force has to take it back by force. The Israelis, caught off guard and outnumbered almost five to one, find themselves in a desperate fight for survival. They're facing a very different Egyptian army. This time, they're in for a very rude awakening. Two mighty tank forces clash in an epic 18-day battle, a battle that will determine the fate of the entire Middle East. There is no retreat. We have only one alternative, victory. The Sinai Peninsula, a vast desert in Western Egypt, separating Israel and the Egyptian heartland. It is one of the most lonely and desolate places on the planet. But in 1967, this was the stage for one of the swiftest and most dramatic victories in the history of warfare. June 5th, 1967. Israel launches a preemptive strike against Egyptian forces massing along its border and catches them completely off guard. In less than a week, Israeli forces seize the entire Sinai Peninsula and they dig in, building fortifications all along the Suez Canal. For the Egyptians, it is a humiliating blow. Someone came to my house, take half of it. Can you live with someone in your house? Bother you every day and tell you what you're gonna do about it? And this is the day when we decide to do something about it. As soon as the 1967 war ends, Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser begins completely rebuilding his battered army. It took Egypt uh, a good six years of training, of straight, hard training, restructuring of all the system in the army. By the fall of 1973, it is a force of over 300,000 well-trained men, 2,000 artillery pieces, and 2,400 tanks. But it will take more than just men and machines to beat the battle-hardened Israelis. Egyptians know that they need to catch Israel by surprise. The Egyptians develop a plan they develop one of the most remarkable deception campaigns of the last hundred years. They practice forming up their units, driving to the canal, and then they practice the canal crossing itself. And they do it over and over and over again. So that over the course of time, the Israelis just come to expect it. It just becomes a part of the scenery. Beyond that, the Israelis have grown complacent in their defensive positions and believe the Egyptians pose no serious threat. See the Sixth Day War. After such a famous victory, the Israeli army became to be too arrogant. They believe something that wasn't true. They believe that the Egyptian doesn't know how to fight or the Arab doesn't know how to fight and will never fight successfully. In October 1973, all the Israeli Defense Force has to defend its 200-kilometer Sinai front are 18,000 men, 100 artillery pieces, and less than 300 tanks. A tiny defensive force, woefully ill-prepared for battle, 
History Hit is a streaming platform that is just for history fans, with fantastic documentaries covering fascinating figures and moments in history from all over the world, from the Battle of Trafalgar and the Revolutionary Era right through to the Second World War. If you are looking for your next military history fix, then this is the service for you. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial, and War Stories fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code WARSTORIES at checkout. And on October 6, 1973, Egypt and their Syrian allies launch an immense two-front offensive against Israel. In the opening hours of the attack, Israeli forces are quickly routed. On the northern front, masses of Syrian armor steadily advance into the Golan Heights. And on the Sinai front, the situation for the Israelis is even more desperate. My brigade was the only brigade along the Suez Canal responsible for a, a front of 200 kilometers. Egyptian aircraft were bombing. 2,200 artillery guns were firing ammunition. The feeling was as the desert is moving, like earthquake. I had 88 tanks. and 850 Egyptian tanks were crossing the Suez Canal. The tanks bearing down by the hundreds on Reshef and his men are Soviet-designed T-55s. At 36 tons, the T-55 is relatively small, but it can move at up to 50 kilometers per hour and is armed with a 100 millimeter main cannon providing a perfect balance of speed and deadly firepower. Immediately, we had our first casualties over there. We tried to avoid them from crossing, but the ratio between their forces and our forces were are unthinkable. In response, the Israelis send their elite air force to smash the advancing Egyptian invaders. The Israelis, they always depend on their quick and effective airstrike. So the first lesson the Egyptians uh, consider is to how to eliminate the Israeli airstrike by surface-to-air missile, by creating what we call the wall, okay, a rocket wall. In the first two days, the Israeli Air Force lost more than one third of its airplanes, so they decided to stop any airstrike uh, at all. With the Israeli Air Force neutralized, the Egyptians can begin the most difficult and dangerous phase of their operation, the crossing of the Suez Canal. The minute you just see the canal, you can just have tears, because it was just a great feeling that you get this piece of land back. The Egyptian crossing of Suez is an absolutely brilliant military operation. They have figured out every aspect of the canal crossing. They know that the Israelis are reliant on these huge sand barriers to try to keep the Egyptians away, and they develop high-powered water hoses that allow them to effectively just spray holes using water to erode the sand and cut passages through these Israeli sand berms. The Egyptian operation has gone like clockwork. And in the first 18 hours of the attack, they send 90,000 men and 850 tanks across the Suez Canal. By the end of the day, the Egyptians have advanced almost eight kilometers into the Sinai. 
Now all that stands between the Egyptian invasion force and the Israeli heartland are a couple of hundred tanks, most of which are just arriving on the battlefield as part of the IDF's armored reserves. The Israeli armored reserves in Sinai immediately do what they have been trained, taught, ordered to do, counterattack. This time, they're in for a very rude awakening. October 6, 1973. After a massive artillery barrage and wave after wave of airstrikes, hundreds of Egyptian tanks surge across the Suez Canal and storm into the Israeli-occupied Sinai Desert. The feeling was is the desert is moving like earthquake. The handful of Israelis defending the 200 kilometer front are caught off guard and quickly overwhelmed. And by the end of the day, the Egyptians have advanced eight kilometers into the Sinai. Desperate to staunch the Egyptian invasion, Israel calls up its armored reserves, and by October 8th, they are ready to strike back. The Israeli armored reserves in Sinai immediately do what they have been trained, taught, ordered to do, counterattack. The Israeli plan calls for the lead elements of their reserve forces, 100 tanks strong, to attack straight into Egyptian positions, break up their formations, and force them back across the canal. Leading the 217th Reserve Armored Brigade against Egyptian positions near the Ferdan Bridge is Colonel Natki Nir. The next day, on the 8th, I received an order to move southward and to attack. On my left, another tank brigade was supposed to attack. But when I got my orders to attack towards the Firdan, there were no forces on my left. When we approached to about 600 meters from the direction of the canal, we encountered an inferno of shelling. A tank division and an infantry division with tanks were already on our side of the canal. They sat on our sand ramparts, on our side of the canal, and hunted us. We started the attack without artillery. Without air support, and the whole attack depended on tanks. It was the first time we understood that the Egyptians were equipped with thousands of Sager missiles. The AT-3 Sager is a Soviet-designed portable anti-tank guided missile. Fitted with a 2.6 kilogram warhead, the Sager can penetrate 200 millimeters of armor at ranges up to three kilometers. But its most deadly feature is a wire guidance system, which allows the operator to steer the missile all the way to the target. The operator has an optical sight and he concentrates on the target, he fires the missile, and using a joystick, literally direct the missile onto the target at distance. It's effective. And it allows Egyptian Sagar operators to fire volleys of missiles with a fairly good hit rate. So that the small numbers of Israeli tanks that are charging at them wind up suffering heavy casualties, much heavier than they had ever expected the battalion faced mainly Sager missiles. They did a job on my brigade. I 
gave an order to retreat. This is the only time in my life that I gave such an order. Out of the approximately 22 tanks, six got out, and the rest were all destroyed. This was a different army. This was not the same army I fought against in the Six Day War. They crushed the Israeli counter attack on October 8th, crushed it completely. This is an unbelievable victory by the Egyptians, something that they have never achieved beforehand, and it is a stunning reversal for the Israelis. By nightfall on October 8th, Egyptian forces have widened their bridgehead almost 10 kilometers into the Sinai. The ferocity and magnitude of the attack has forced most of the Israelis back, but a few remain trapped deep behind Egyptian lines. We came to the conclusion that we have to try to evacuate the people from this position on the Suez Canal. The problem was that between this position and us, there were five in fourth infantry division with about 1,500 tanks. We moved. My tank was the left one. Shaul was next to me. When we entered in, the Egyptian opened fire. I saw Sagers moving towards my tank. So you, you see a kind of fireball moving towards you. And when I saw a missile coming to me, I was breaking my direction. And they missed my tank. And on my tank there were some cables of the saga. After two, three minutes, I saw a group of 30 people on one of the dunes. And when I came to the range of 100 meters or so, I realized that they were Egyptian. And then I had my, my own personal fight, because it was either them or me. I used my machine gun, grenades, and then I had to go over them with my tank. And I killed all these 20 people. Then I realized that I was by myself. I took my binocular, watching, and I saw a monster moving. A gun, and something undefined. And then I realized that there were soldiers on a tank. Shaul took all the 33 of them on his tank, and moved out. With their frontline soldiers rescued, the Israelis fall back to defensive positions near the strategically important passes through the Sinai Mountains. From the 9th, a new phase begins in which we are on the defensive without any offensive intentions. Not to seek contact, but to rebuild our force. As the Israelis pause to regroup, 
the Egyptians prepare for an enormous armored offensive, one they hope will drive their enemy out of the Sinai for good. October 14, 1973. In just over a week, Egyptian forces have pushed 10 kilometers deep into the Sinai and easily repel every Israeli attempt at counterattack. On the southern front of the October War, the Egyptians are doing well. Their cross-canal operation has worked. They've pushed into Sinai, but they have a problem. Their ally, Syria. Syria is not experiencing the same degree of success. Syrian forces have not only failed to secure their objectives on the Golan, but the Israelis are now smashing them. Hoping to draw Israeli forces away from their Syrian allies, the Egyptians launch a massive armored offensive in the Sinai. Their plan, attack with two armored divisions and a gigantic pincer movement, aimed at smashing the Israeli forces guarding the passes through the Sinai Mountains. At first light on October 14th, 1,000 Egyptian tanks advanced towards Israeli lines. When the Egyptians renew their offensive on October 14th, the attack that they launch is the absolute antithesis of the attacks that they had launched on October 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th. This time around, they don't have that same plan. The Egyptians simply lumber forward in the kind of clumsy frontal assaults that they had been famous for in 67. And this time around, the Israelis are waiting. We received an alert that on the 14th, the 21st Egyptian Armored Division will cross the canal and try to advance and capture territory. Very early in the morning, we were under a terrible artillery fire. When the smoke cleared, the first tanks of the brigade that were opposite us were already upon us. First of all, we knew they were coming. We waited for them. I saw hundreds of tanks moving forward. Tsunami. A huge wave moving towards you. And I said, oh God, how can I stop them? It is like a Wild West duel. The first to draw stays alive. They move into fire position and we fired on one thing after the other. Every tank was behind camouflage on a hill and only the guns were sticking out. From the start, in such a situation, when they are in motion and we choose the firing positions, that gives us a huge advantage. Here is the case where our quality, gunnery quality, is important. One of the Israelis' main battle tanks is a modified version of the American M48 Patton, known as the Magak. It is well protected with 120 millimeters of frontal armor and has a 105 millimeter cannon that can accurately hit targets at ranges of up to three and a half kilometers. 
superb guns on the tanks that the Israelis are deploying in Sinai allow them to begin hitting and killing the Egyptian tanks long before the Egyptians are able to start destroying Israeli tanks. The Israelis have become expert at long-range gunnery. We were fighting very accurately, aiming and destroying tank by tank. All the Egyptian tanks were in the area which was dominated with us, by us, were destroyed. Within simply a matter of hours, the entire Egyptian attack has been completely unhinged. And they lost in this one day around 250 tanks. We felt the first time that we can make it. For the Egyptians, the promise of victory now gives way to the reality of defeat and Sadat orders his battered armored divisions to fall back to defensive positions. But these positions are vulnerable. When originally formed, the Egyptians left a dangerous gap between their second army and the Great Bitter Lake. Israel is now ready to grab the initiative and go back on the offensive. And they use this piece of information, this gap, this seam, to plan their counteroffensive. The Israeli plan is to get to the canal, cross over it to get behind the Egyptian formations and to be able to tear them up from the inside out. October 14th, 1973. In an effort to finally achieve victory in the Sinai, Egyptian forces launch a massive armored assault, over 1,000 tanks strong, against the Israeli defenders. But in less than a day, the Israelis destroy 260 enemy tanks, forcing the Egyptians to pull back towards the Suez Canal. But the Egyptians have left a gap in their lines, giving the Israelis an opening to advance to the canal. The Israeli plan is to get to the canal, cross over it to get behind the Egyptian formations, and to be able to tear them up from the inside out. Before the Israelis can cross the canal, they must secure their flank against the Egyptian Second Army, positioned a few kilometers north in a small agricultural area called the Chinese Farm. We didn't know exactly where the enemy position were located. When I entered into the area which was north to the Chinese farm, I realized that I am in the hell. Israelis perhaps have bit off more than they could chew, because they're in the midst of not only a heavily reinforced Egyptian infantry division, they're also in the middle of an Egyptian armored division. Hundreds of Egyptian soldiers were firing. There were tanks, anti-tank gun, a lot of action. I was fighting against two divisions. The ratio was unthinkable. So I was firing with my machine gun, grenades, 
with my cannon. I realized that I am in the hell. We were all these hours under such a pressure of Egyptian tanks, infantry, everything. We could see wave of tanks trying to recapture the positions that we already captured. After about half an hour, I saw five tanks in the range of 50 meters. When they came to the range of 30 meters, I realized that they are Egyptian tanks. And we fired five very high speed rounds. Pack, 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 pack. We destroyed all the five tanks. night with Egyptian units and tanks. The range between the Egyptian tank and my tank was sometime half a meter, meter. Fire, darkness, blood. There is no better description like the real hell. I lost 121 soldiers and a lot of commanders in that terrible night. The Battle of Chinese Farm will go on to last another three days. And when it's finally over, hundreds of destroyed Israeli and Egyptian tanks litter the battlefield. The heavy price paid by the Israelis clears the way for a task force to advance to the canal. And they immediately begin work on building a bridge but the Egyptians quickly react. The Egyptians finally found the bridgehead and that's when the inferno began. The bridgehead went up in flames. Everything was burning. It has been 11 days since Egypt launched a massive offensive into the Israeli-occupied Sinai. After hundreds of tanks are destroyed and thousands of men killed. On October 17th, the Israelis are finally ready for their attack into Egypt. Their plan, using temporary bridges, send three armored divisions across the Suez Canal and into central Egypt, where they can attack Egyptian forces from the rear and even threaten the capital of Cairo. I understood that if Grand Division will not cross the canal and we will not be in the other side of the canal in Africa or Egypt, we will lose the war. All what we have done, gone. By 4 p.m., I told everyone, the bridge is ready, go ahead. The Egyptians at this stage were in complete shock. And the Egyptian 
started to understand. It was great. The Egyptians finally found the bridgehead, and that's when the inferno began. Hell started, and the devil started to walk. In this operation where we lost more than 100 people, it was every, under heavy fire on the way. The bridgehead went up in flames. Everything was burning. From the heavy shelling, people were buried alive. There was very heavy fire. Egyptian helicopters dropped barrels full of explosives. People were dying, you know, were injured. And that was a real hell. was the longest night ever in my life. I was not afraid to die. I was afraid if this mission would not be accomplished. And we succeed. response to Israeli tanks on the western banks of the canal is both immediate and lethal. Their plan, attack from the south with a massive armored column aimed at cutting off and trapping the Israelis. The Israelis, they have to go between the two Egyptian armies for a long distance, for like 50 or 60 kilometers, and became very vulnerable to any Egyptian attack. For the attack, the Egyptians send their elite 25th Armored Brigade, 100 of their most modern Soviet-designed tanks, straight into the vulnerable rear of the Israeli bridgehead. October 17, 1973. After 11 days of bloody fighting, Israeli forces finally fight their way across the Suez Canal and begin their invasion of Egypt. Desperate to stem the flow of Israeli tanks across the canal, Egypt counterattacks with its elite 25th Armored Brigade. Their plan is to push north in a massive armored column and destroy the Israeli rear guard, cutting off Israeli forces west of the canal. A brand new brigade armed with with the most advanced Soviet T-62 tanks is now pushing northwards along the Great Bitter Lake. Brené Dan turns southward and hustles down with his division, puts them in place in an L-shaped ambush. Uh, thank him. The first position of our tanks was about three kilometers from the canal. They were camouflaged, so the Egyptians couldn't see them. Advancing straight into the ambush are 100 Soviet-designed T-62 tanks. In 1973, the T-62 is considered one of the best tanks in the world. It is well protected with over 100 millimeters of frontal armor and carries a 115 millimeter smooth bore cannon, a powerful and deadly accurate main gun that can easily destroy an Israeli tank especially at close range. But I don't want our men to move. I don't want the Egyptians to feel anything. I want them to enter, enter, enter the zone of destruction. Once the entire Egyptian brigade entered the ambush area, I gave the order to fire. They set their tanks on fire, one after the other. The 
Egyptians. I can see the battle. The Egyptians tried to counterattack from the top to bottom. They didn't have a chance. They tried to fire several shots, but listen, the ambush was lethal. After two hours, there were a few tanks left that tried to escape. It was a big mess. Some of them drove back towards the Bitter Lake and they ran into a minefield. In two hours, we destroyed the Egyptian 25th Brigade. Almost all of it. Five tanks were able to escape back. After we finished this ambush, I told my division commander to erase the Egyptian 25th Brigade from the enemy territory. With the destruction of the 25th Brigade, the Egyptians lose any hope of stopping the Israeli advance into the Egyptian heartland. By the next morning, the Israelis had elements of two armored divisions, almost 200 tanks, west of the Suez Canal. By October 24th, the Israelis have advanced to within 100 kilometers of Cairo and have encircled the 3rd Egyptian Army. The Israelis have done what they need to do. They have the Third Army trapped, and they know that that is the most important bargaining tool that they need to bring the war to an end on their terms. And so they agree to a ceasefire. It would take another five years of negotiations before Israel finally returns the Sinai to Egypt. For the Egyptians, it is a great victory. The anniversary is a moment to remember our dignity that was retrieved in 73. Honor the people who worked hard for six or seven years to make this victory happen. Anwar Sadat gets everything that he wanted. The Sinai is returned to Egypt, and Anwar Sadat is seen by the Egyptian people as the great victor of Harb al-October, of the October War the man who regained Sinai for Egypt. But Egypt is not alone in declaring victory, as Israel has its own cause to celebrate. They attacked us, and we won in the most difficult possible conditions. The Egyptian army was crushed. The fight that Israel underwent in 1973 is a great victory for Israel, but it is a traumatic experience. We had nearly 3,000 casualties in this war. For us, this is an enormous number. There's no Israel after 1973 who wants to go through that again. That convinces Israel, too, that the best answer to their situation with Egypt is to simply make peace.